Okay. So, Dr. Trish Lay, welcome yeah. to the labyrinth. So, how, how are you doing? How are things? I'm great. On... Thank you for having me because this is an important conversation. I'm glad to be able to chat with you. Yeah. So, why did you choose neuroscience as a career path? Hmm, that's a good question. And I was always interested, um, even when I was young, you know, the brain obviously is one of the most fascinating things in the world. And on, for me, understanding, even probably when I was young, understanding my own behaviors and how it goes back to kind of that, you know, hard drive in the computer, I call me, <laughs> was interesting in figuring out like what's running the show and, you know, how it's impacting the way I think and the way I behave. And when I went to school, I was always interested in those aspects, kind of like the inner workings and then how it relates to what's going on in the on the outside. So who do you think is running the show? Am I in control of my life? <laughs> well, that depends where your brain's at. <laughs> and, and honestly, because yesterday I was talking to a woman and she's like, you know, um, don't you th think, you know, men and women's brains run differently? And they do. But her point was that like men act differently than women. And I said, my answer to her, we were just chatting, was that regulated brains, brains that are optimized and are in a good spot, they all act very similarly. They act in a healthy way. They are happy. There's peace. They can extend love dysregulated brains act in all different ways. You know, there's chronic pain, anxiety, depression, mood swings. You know, if, if your brain's not in the optimal mode, there's lots of optimal modes that give us that behavior. So honestly, that is really what is the deciding factor if you're running the show or if the show's running you because your brain's not in that optimal mode. If you optimize your brain, you, you know, that's why I always say control your brain. You can control your brain and use it as the best tool that you have to create the life you want. Huh. Are there any easy steps to control or optimize my brain? Yeah, there's simple steps, but simple isn't always easy. You know how that goes. And really it's like about the way, the easiest thing to do, the most simple is how you live your life. And this is so difficult for so many people. And that's why when I talk with people, it's like, do you like your job? Do you enjoy the people you spend your time with? Do you do your hobbies? Do you do the things that put you on purpose? That's the easiest way to control your brain. But most people's answer is, I don't really love my job or my job stresses me out. I love it, but it totally stresses me out. If it totally stresses you out, you need to figure that out and Make it so you can enjoy your job and not have it totally stress you out. Same thing about relationships. People tell me all the time, like, you know, this and that thing's going on and they don't enjoy being with their partner. Well, that's a bummer, right? <laughs> and then my favorite one is I say, what do you do for fun? And they go, I really love to uh, swim. When's the last time you went swimming? 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And men try to manage their stress in different ways, a very common thing that men use to control or to distract themselves from stress is through pornography. Why do you think so many young men are addicted to pornography? Yeah, because it's so good at doing that. And so the reality is, you know, it's, they call it the triple A's. It's affordable, accessible, and anonymous. So now young men have porn in their pocket at all times. And what happens is I call it a push and pull effect is that porn is a super normal stimulus. So if you see it, your brain gets this rush of dopamine and it feels good, really good. So it's going to pull you back in after you've seen it once, honestly, twice, definitely. So it pulls your brain back in. So at the same time, then a stressor happens and it pushes you into that thing that made you feel so good. So it is, it becomes the tool that young men find to offset stress instead of healthy ways of offsetting stress. The problem with that is inadvertently, people, mostly men, are teaching their brains that when a stressor happens, 
the solution is to go to porn instead of the solution is to go towards those difficult feelings and that that challenging thing to deal with it's called approach so instead of learning to approach and to kind of move through that hard thing they're teaching their brains to escape into a flood of dopamine and it creates this pattern that becomes habitual which becomes a compulsion which becomes a dependency yes i yeah, I think uh, in many ways, porn is addicted to stress because most men uh, do not watch porn because they are horny, but because they are stressed, lonely, bored, and depressed. It's almost like porn has nothing to do with sex. It has <laughs> nothing to do with sex. I tell people this all the time, is that it has to do with connection. It has to do with intimacy but it's the opposite. It's isolation and it's fake. It's not intimacy. But so when people feel lonely, they get the sense of being connected to somebody through this neurological connection. It is neurological. So like to go back to our first point about like, are, is your brain controlling you? When you have a sexual urge to go to watch porn, it's actually a call for mood regulation. It's a call to offset stress or boredom. And it has nothing to do with sex, but it fills this like important need that you would typically get from people and experiences and relationships in the world. It fills it in this distorted way on a neurological level. So it feels good. So people just, it's linked to the screen. And when that linking happens, it's very difficult to unlink that. And that's what I help people do. Okay. So it's a substitute for, um, empathy in a way it's a substitute for community i guess it, yeah and actually we know that it sucks empathy out of people because mm -hmm. when you're viewing other people as a performance you forget that those are human beings that have minds and hearts and lives and you objectify them they become objects for your pleasure and over time what that does to men is that women in the world or even men in the world become objects for their neurological pleasure. So it takes the humanity out of humanity, which then is a decrease in empathy. You no longer connect with people on a whole person level. You're just using their body parts to get a dopamine hit. And, you know, I talked to hundreds, thousands of people actually who are experiencing this. And, you know, it's really difficult because then what happens is their brains are not trained to connect to people in the real world like it would be if they never saw porn. And that's why I think, you know, porn's probably the most devastating thing we have going on right now, not because of the sexual aspect, like you just said, because of the human aspect. Uh, you said that you talk to a lot of people. Do you talk to a lot of younger boys? Because most men uh, get addicted to porn at a very young age, as young as maybe when they're in school, in middle school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and every even young men and old, that's their story. The story is very similar for each person. It's, I found porn in adolescence. Usually somebody showed me. It made me, my brain feel really good. After that, I started masturbating to it and I was hooked and it became a way to self-soothe. What I help people figure out is, what were you self-soothing back then? What are you self-soothing right now? How do we alleviate the pain or the difficulty associated with those things so you can feel great so you don't need something to self-soothe anymore? But yeah, you're totally right. Like most people, the, the large, vast majority found it in adolescence. And we know now from the science that kids as young as eight, it's eight to 11 years old is the average age that, that kids are finding it. And teenagers are the most, the most, the biggest part of the population that visits porn sites. So next generation is gonna be in trouble because it's damaging their brains. Can parents do anything about it? Should parents confiscate their children's uh, cell phones? Well, definitely help them manage it and, you know, have parental blockers on until they're of a certain age where they learn to manage their phones. Definitely help them. Like, you know, I'm more of the mindset that we should be teaching K 
kids and everybody to regulate themselves. It's called self-regulation. It's the thing that's missing if you have a porn habit and you're going back. If you have to self-soothe with porn, it means you can't regulate yourself well in the world. So if we teach kids to regulate themselves, they won't ever need to go on porn, but it is you know, a super normal stimulus that grabs the brain when you see it. So we have to let kids know, if you see images, don't watch them, click out, and this is why. And a lot of people tell me that their parents told them not to watch porn, but they never told them it was going to harm their brain, it was going to become addictive, that it would be very difficult to stop. So even though parents said, don't watch porn, the why is actually very important. And I've created a nonprofit organization, which I call, I call pornbrainprevention.org to teach parents to be able, and, or, and parents and youth organization leaders, schools, to teach the way to talk to kids about not watching porn, giving them the why so they're empowered. So they get like, this is gonna mess me up over time. You know, porn's proven to create anxiety, depression, erectile dysfunction. More teenagers and young men have erectile dysfunction than ever before. And that's only going to get worse. So if you tell any young dude porn's going to give them erectile dysfunction, that's a big why not to watch porn. Yes. Um, yes. Kids get exposed to pornography at a very young age. But besides porn, they also get... Uh, they're also exposed to music videos today, music videos or movies uh, or even children's, some of children's shows are so sexualized. Is it even possible uh, to prevent kids from watching these things that they're not ready for? No, it's everywhere. It's worse than ever, especially with, so, especially with social media. And absolutely, music is pervasive. Like, I like music. I don't know if you've ever heard me talk. I, I jam out around here a lot. And, and, you know, half the songs that come on, more than half of the songs that are popular now are just completely sexualized. And it's a bummer because the music's good, but the message is terrible. And it's reinforcing all the messages that are triggering to people who do consume pornography or sexual media on social media. So it's just pervasive. It's very difficult to escape. And, you know, I've actually wondered if, if it would ever hit a tipping point in my lifetime where we would see that shift back because it is so damaging to people's brains. And if other people, scientists and the community will begin to connect the dots between seemingly harmless sexualized music and images on social media to all the brain problems that and all the mental health and thinking issues that fall out because you're right it's hard to escape but yes. but the takeaway the action step because i always try to help people with a what to do is you know to consume the least amount of that as possible and so like if you're watching a lot of music videos don't okay. you know if you're someone yeah. told me you know Coachella, the concert was on last weekend mm -hmm. and that Coachella was going to be really triggering. And it never, it actually occurred to me. So if you're listening, I don't even remember who it was. It didn't even occur to me that like that person was just going to watch all of Coachella mm -hmm. and, and allow themselves to be triggered all weekend long. And mm -hmm. then when I was working over the weekend, I clicked the, you know, Coachella link on YouTube and actually it was Harry Styles, but he was wearing a you know, a pimped out rainbow suit. But I was thinking, now I get it. That person's going to put themselves in a position to be triggered all weekend. Like, don't do that then. You know, don't. Listen to the music if you want. Watch a little bit. Watch one or two people who you find not triggering. But it's difficult to do. But that's teaching people self-regulation. Recognizing this is not good for me. This puts me in a bad place. I'm not going to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is quite obvious that men would be better off without pornography, but should men also quit masturbation? That's a loaded question, but if you have been watching pornography, yes. The answer is a yes with an exclamation point, a resounding yes. And this is the reason why, but it's tricky. And I'll give you a, a caveat to that. You know, if you've never watched porn, you might be able to establish a quote unquote healthy masturbation habit, one where you don't go to fantasy, you're not recalling porn scenes, you're not thinking about things you wish were done to you, 
you're staying with the sensations in your body, which like 0.0001% of the male population can actually do. So when I tell people to do that, they're like, what's the fun in that? I'm like, I know, exactly. So like, if you take all of that hypersexuality out of masturbation, there is no point for most people. They can't pull it off because it includes all the other stuff. So like, if you've been in that culture of, of porn and sexual media, you likely won't be able to establish a healthy masturbation habit. But here's the tricky part. I work with a lot of people who are having challenges in their relationship because they have watched porn for so long. So they might not be in a place yet where they've repaired their sexual relationship with their partner. Or I also work with a lot of people who don't have partners. And, and we know from the science too, more young men are choosing to watch porn than to try to get girlfriends. And then they do have erectile dysfunction. So even when they try to get a girlfriend, they can't perform and it sends them back to porn. It's a vicious cycle for young men. So if you're, if you don't have a partner and you're really trying to quit porn, you have to leave masturbation behind for at least a while to let all that hypersexuality unravel. But if too much time passes, I do think some people, but you have to feel it out. If you can stay with the sensations in your body and schedule it, this part you'll love too. You don't use it when you feel stressed out because then you're using it as that mood regulation tool. It has to be scheduled so that you're, you know, you're trying to develop like healthy sexuality by yourself, which is obviously an, an oxymoron. So, you know, it's a tricky thing to do, but the answer would be if you're watching porn and you have not given it up yet and you're trying, the answer is no, you can't masturbate. It's got to unravel in your brain and your mind. Are there any health benefits to giving up masturbation? Does it increase a man's testosterone or sperm count? Yeah, well, I actually did a video not long ago, and this is very controversial because, you know, the science is actually, what the science doesn't account for is compulsive masturbation versus healthy masturbation. So the idea is, so it's controversial because of that. So I'm only going to answer it from the standpoint of compulsive masturbation, because if you're watching porn, generally you're coupling that with masturbation. And most people I talk to masturbate a lot, which is compulsive. So the idea is if you're doing that over and over and over, you're, yeah, you're depleting your body. You're, you're frying your brain. You're depleting your brain of electrical energy and neurotransmitters. We know that it desensitizes the reward center because of all the physical stimulation. So then yes, you're, and so the study that I just made a video on shows that if you abstain for seven days, your testosterone levels will increase. And that's why healthy sexuality is important. And there's another study that shows that people who, who had sex with a partner had healthier prostates than those who masturbated. So like, if you just think about it logically too, without even science being involved, if you're doing something that is not designed to be done by yourself all the time, you're, you're, you know, you're abusing the system, your body and your brain and your mind, where if you're, if you have a healthy sexual habit with a partner, which has less mental and physical stimulation, but it has natural levels, not supernatural levels. That's what's healthy for the brain, body, body, and mind. Okay. Now I'm going to ask a slightly controversial question. It's not really a controversial question, but okay, it's something great. that I'm <laughs> it's something that I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about masturbation negatively, it's usually about men. Female masturbation, on the other hand, is glorified and seen as beautiful. Uh, why do you think male masturbation? By men, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> right? By men. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, these standards are usually set by men. Uh, and so the question is, uh -huh. why is male masturbation looked down upon and female masturbation is glorified? Sure. And I don't think it's controversial at all. I think it's a great question. And actually, when I work with people and they are trying to repair their relationship with their partner, this is something I teach them. So I think it's a great question that a lot of people have. So if you're masturbating a lot and absolutely, if you watch porn, a, a, you know, even not even a lot, I won't even use the word a lot consistently and frequently, and especially with intensity, 
your brain gets in this hypersexual mode. So the majority of men right now are in a hypersexual mode. They're thinking about sex, looking for sex, wanting higher levels of sex a lot. So a lot of guys tell me like, I'm just a guy who has a higher libido. No, you're not. It's not about libido. We already said it's not about sex. It's about mood regulation. So actually what the deal is, is that your brain's in a hypersexual looking for sex mode to make you feel better, to de-stress you. So what happens in, in society is that women are hyposexual. They are actually taught to be less than sexual than they should be. You know, you're not, as a woman, you're not supposed to talk about sex, think about sex, definitely not enjoy sex. So like when, when we conceptualize a woman enjoying sex, especially by herself, that is glorified. And we're like, wow, that's really cool because women, that's not supposed to be a thing. And again, like I said, a lot of times it is glorified by men. So when I work with people, the, the solutions in the middle, if you are a hypersexual person, you have to bring that hypersexuality down. If you're a hyposexual partner or woman, you have to figure out what you like about sex with your partner. And if that includes, you know, I, I, thinking about masturbation, like masturbation could be included in a healthy partnered sex experience to keep that stimulation going at lower levels that's combined. But the point is like hypersexuality comes down, hyposexuality comes up, and then men and women meet in the middle where we don't have to say, you know, men shouldn't be masturbating. We don't have to say, wow, it's so cool when women masturbate. If men were masturbating less and women were enjoying sex more, in the middle, you meet with more partnered sex that everybody's enjoying. Okay. Uh, let me add another controversial element into the equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, so there are men who want to use these, uh, who wants to use this as a stress buster. Okay, but they're not masturbating. Instead, they go to a brothel. They mm -hmm. use a prostitute. Mm -hmm. How does that affect their mental health? Yeah, sure. So um, typically what happens is if men have to, and I use the word have to, if they feel the need to go act out with a human being, so prostitutes, brothels, escorts with a better name, usually it's because the need in their brain for that hypersexual stimulation has increased. Videos are no longer doing it. And again, going back to science, we don't need science for this one though. There's studies that show that the things that men want to do with prostitutes are the things that they've seen in porn. Number one, prostitutes say, all the men who come to me, they want to do things they've seen in porn. So the point is that they're generally unhealthy sexual acts that a healthy woman would not want to engage in. So they have to go find an unhealthy woman emotionally. Emotionally healthy woman would not allow a stranger to use her body for sex. That's, you know, we can argue that later if you'd like, but that's a strong contention. So like men are going to do that because they need more stimulation from an actual human being. It's an escalation of a sexual addiction. But I'm going to give you one caveat because there's people out there that I would say, I, I didn't ever use porn, but I go to prostitutes. Some men, the way that this addictive or compulsive behavior began is with other people. So they never get their brains linked to the screen. It's always linked to being with many different partners in the real world. And it's more just objectified sex with actual human partners. But going back to our discussion before, it lacks intimacy. It lacks connection. It's the opposite of what a healthy sexual experience should be. That man's just using that actual human being woman, using them for their own pleasure, for no connection, no happiness, no joy. And, you know, it's a full dopamine hit that they're getting. When you have sex with a partner you care about, it's dopamine, serotonin for happiness and oxytocin for connection. And just one more thing, an interesting story that I talked, I talked to a lot of people about this, but just in my mind from one person recently, that one guy that I was talking with, he was saying how like he could be with girls that he didn't care about and he could 
perform well and go a really long time, no erectile dysfunction problems. But then there's this girl that he's interested in and he really cares about her. And he has erectile dysfunction problems with her. I'm like, because you're just using those other women as objects. But when, so it's all just dopamine, your brain's just getting dopamine. But when your brain's looking for dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, you're thrown off because you can't get the higher level stimulation when you're using people because you don't want to use this woman because you actually care about her. That's what it's supposed to be about. But we're trained, you know, people are training their brains to go in the opposite direction. And like, even if we take it down a notch from brothels or prostitutes, just hookup culture. You know, young people are like, you know, I talk to young people all the time. They're like, you know, I don't want a serious relationship. I just want to be with people. It's like, that's easier. You've convinced yourself because you've been watching porn. You've convinced yourself, like just being with a person for a night is, is what your brain needs for dopamine. But what your brain actually wants is dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin for a happy life. Would we be better off in a conservative society where we are promoting the idea of marriage and long-term relationships? Well, honestly, I've questioned this and I am married and I have a lot of kids, but I, and I know I'm going to take some heat for this one too. The answer is, I don't know. I've actually changed my mind on like partners for life type of thing. I think if you can find a partner and grow with them over the course of your life, and work at it, that is actually the spice of life. That is what life is about. And the greatest lessons in your life can be learned through a partner you like being with. And it's hard. You know, my husband and I have been married 20 years. We have a blast together. Of course, we argue about things. We don't agree about things. But for the the 99%, like we always love each other and we are learning from each other and we're growing because we're together. And we know that and we think it's cool. Most people these days can't do that because their brains aren't in a position to be able to do that. So my point is like, we know again from science that people actually want one partner. Evolutionarily, that's what we're designed for. The science on polyamory, having multiple partners shows only one person's happy in that. The other people are just being used. It's a dopamine thing for the most part. So the point is like, maybe not forever, but one partner at a time, for sure, because that we want the connection. We're convincing ourselves we don't want the connection because it's scary and hard to be vulnerable and to do the hard things of like, you know, letting yourself op- being open up to heartache or, you know, all the tough stuff that comes with relationships. But that if you can do that, that's what people want. But if the relationship doesn't last a lifetime because you can't grow together, then maybe, you know, there's room for having seasons of life with partners. I work with a lot of people who are super unhappy in their marriages. So like my answer to them isn't stay in that unhappy marriage for the rest of your life. Answer number one is see if you can repair that marriage because it's been messed up from all this sexual stuff. But if you can't, like life's way too short to be in a relationship that doesn't serve you. So do the scary thing and put yourself out there and find someone to connect with. Hmm. Yeah, sounds tough. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough, but it's, it's amazing too. Like when you do it, it's really amazing. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how long will it take um, to feel the mental advantages of uh, abstinence from masturbation and pornography? Yeah, so it depends on how many positive things you're doing when you decide to quit porn and masturbation. So it's not about time. It's about training your brain in the right direction. And the way I talk about it, which hopefully is easy to understand, is that like the minute you stop watching porn, you're starting to unwire the brain pattern that you've been reinforcing through porn use. So, you know, you stop, your brain starts to unwire, but unwiring is only one part of the journey. The more things you do to rewire your brain to find healthy ways to offset stress and boredom and to develop healthy sexuality, those are the two main things. When, and actually there's one more. The third thing is you have to grow up your emotional intelligence. The reason 
that you don't know how to offset stress is because stress builds because as kids, we never learned how to effectively deal with stress. That's what I meant about self-regulation. So like when you figure out how to deal with stress in the first place, how to offload stress and how to develop healthy sexuality, your brain rewires much more quickly. And so then the time shrinks on how long it takes to feel better. So like, you know, I work with people, one guy in particular, I tell his story uh, often enough because he's like, when am I gonna feel bad? I'm like, you're not, you would have felt bad already. <laughs> he was just feeling better and better and better immediately because he was doing a lot of the right stuff. But then there's other people who just try really hard not to watch porn, don't get in a program or don't do the right steps. And then they struggle because they're not doing the new positive things. They're just trying not to watch porn. And then that's a place that can feel not good for a long time. Since a huge portion of men are addicted to pornography and masturbation, should women be more empathetic towards these men? And how can women be more empathetic to them? Yeah, great question. I love this. I think women should be empathetic, but tough. Hmm. I know men aren't going to want to hear that. The way they can be empathetic is understanding that this was something that happened to them when they were 10. It's not a thing they're choosing to do right now at 35 because it's easy to go stop watching porn and be, be with me. It makes me feel bad. But if it was just that easy, men would quit if they cared about their women, which most men do. You know, we already said men want to be with their women. Their brains get all distorted and they, they get all mixed up and they stop valuing their partner and overvaluing porn because that's where the reward is. So when women can understand, it really is neurological. It's a brain problem. They can be empathetic, but they have to be tough and go, it's me or it. Because that addictive nature in the brain, science proves this again, is that the bigger the loss, the bigger the brain will switch itself in the moment when, so like if a guy knows their partner's absolutely dead serious, that, that woman's leaving today and is going to tell everybody what the problem is today, they double down on committing to stopping porn. Committing 100% is, is literally probably the hardest part because most men don't think it's really a big problem and don't see how it's impacting them. And, and they're like, okay, I'll quit. But in the back of their mind, they're like, I'll watch it every once in a while. Like, she'll never know that. But that is where the problem lies. So like if a woman goes, I feel bad that you're wrapped up in this thing. I understand this is very difficult for you. That's empathy, but I'm going to need you to do everything to start to stop right now. You've got 30 days. That's the boundary, 30 days to get into a program. And we start communicating on this and we, we start, we go against this addiction together. When people do that, the time frame shortened and everybody's better. So it's empathy, but it's not like, oh, I understand this is difficult for you go figure this out, you know, by yourself, because that's a, a recipe for disaster, not a success recipe. So it's empathy plus learning the boundaries. And actually I offer a program for women. It's called sanity after betrayal. And it's at sanityafterbetrayal.com. It's a digital program where people, women learn about what's happening to their men in their brain and what women can do to gently and lovingly and empathetically show up to help their man commit to leaving porn behind so that less relationships are destroyed and people can start battling this together because that's how we'll help the world overall too. Okay. Earlier you mentioned that you've been, you have been married for 20 years. Uh, how important is honest communication in a long-term relationship? It's super important. But what I've also learned from 20 years of marriage is that I told my husband this not long ago. It's crazy. I said, dude, I'm pretty sure we have different definitions of honest. <laughs> and, I, and, and we actually, it's pretty funny because we just, um, our friends, my husband organized it, but our friends did it. We had a, a marriage renewal ceremony because our 20th anniversary was just a month ago. It was very cool. But we were joking that like the definitions of honesty are different. So, you know, we're kind of like, are we on the same page of what honest means? And it, it wasn't even anything that was bad. It was just like, um, I can't even think of an instance. 
and my, my husband and I talk about everything, but, and really I can think of something is that it goes back to what you were saying about men dealing with stress. This is a fundamental problem. And this is actually very important. I'm glad I thought of the example. My husband was really stressed out, but he didn't want to tell me because he wanted to handle it himself. And so I could see something going on with him because he was like getting weirder by the day. And finally he, I'm like, dude, tell me what's going on. What is up? You know, and this is what happens. And especially if a man's running to porn, he's like, you know, I got this problem in my business. He actually had like five problems in his business. One was that he was being audited by the IRS and he just, he just wanted to handle that by himself, which it ended up going totally fine. Great, actually. But I'm like, oh, like I get it now. So I could have empathy for him that he was struggling with this IRS thing and these other things. So I got what the weird behavior was about. I didn't have to like take that on and and so I'm like, why didn't you tell me? He's like, you know, I'm just used, I'm trained to deal with stressful work stuff and not share it with you. I'm like, this is a perfect example of honesty. Like I can handle, like there's literally, there's nothing I can't handle. I feel like, cause I've handled lots of difficult things. I'm like, just tell me, I, I won't try to fix it for you. And so, and he's, he told me something this morning. I don't remember what and he goes, thanks for, he said it this morning. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks for acknowledging that. Cause I said, yeah, that it sounds challenging, but you know, I'm sure you'll figure it out. And so then like, that's a perfect example of honesty, like sharing your feelings and the things that are difficult. Like as a man, if you are scared or you have fear, you're trained not to share that with people. But when you share that with your partner and if your partner's emotionally mature enough to handle that, you become closer and that honest communication continues to be built. So your relationship gets better, not worse. And like, you know, you feel like you're not alone in this world anymore. You actually have somebody who's there to support you in difficult stuff. Like, it's amazing. That's the amazing things that I'm talking about in the moments. Like, oh my gosh, like, are you telling me you're going to owe the feds a hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> but like, and it ended up being fine, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, another insecurity that I think a lot of us men have is that we don't want to be a burden to others, which is why we don't like sharing our problems. Totally. A guy that I'm working with, he says he has really close friends, best friends, and he sees them once a year. And when they see each other, they just connect and they, they hash out all the things that are going on in their lives, good or bad. And I said to him, why do you only talk to him one time a year? He's like, everybody's busy. So it's so funny because as the action step, I have him trying to connect with them. And it's not easy because they live all over the world and they're super busy and busy jobs. But I'm like, he's like, I feel like I'm a burden to them. I'm like, you're not. And if they need to make time to talk to you, they need that conversation with you more than you need it with them because you've reached out to them. I'm like, it's only going to be good for all of you. Trust me on this. Like, you're not a burden. Just make it fun and share your heart and stay connected more than once a year. And he's working out, but it's so, it's weirding him out that he, you know, he doesn't want to be a burden, but it's not a burden. Like, and this is what I said to him. If people are emotionally mature and it's a big if, and we can talk about what that is if you want, but it means like, I can understand you're going through a hard time. I can feel empathetic for you, but I don't take all that junk on. And it doesn't make me feel worse. I'm just here to help you feel better. That's why you have to have your energy in a good place. Your brain has to be optimized so that you can give to that person, not take it on and become stressed out for them because then it makes that person feel better. And then there is no burden because I actually feel better if I can help you and you feel better because you were helped. Everybody wins. Like, you know, all the energy goes up, not down. Yeah, yeah. That's a very practical uh, advice. Do you think uh, the COVID lockdowns that trapped us indoors in the past two years have increased a feeling of loneliness, uh, depression, and uh, screen addiction? Yeah, definitely. We know that. There's lots of science that supports all of that. And it's totally a bummer. Like, you know, I felt the effects of COVID when it first hit and it's pretty wild. Like it gave, I'm sure it gave everybody an excuse to watch more porn, to lay around. I was psyched the first month because my, my actual life is so busy. We have six kids. It's a very busy life. When everything was canceled, I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, I don't even care that we're making no money. I just slept in. 
but I only did it for like three weeks because that's my nature. You know, I'm like, okay, break over. Now I'm going to double down on making this time one of growth, one of more happiness than ever. And I was able to do that for my life because I do optimize my brain. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at all. I just, I'm just saying I have strategies and I do the things that I, I teach people. So like, you know, I created more family time where we would cook, we would play games, we would do puzzles. And it became like our house was like filled with joy at all times. And I do have a lot of people in my house, so that's different. But I also work with people that, you know, I'm like, you got to get some joy going in your life. And so those people could connect with other people over FaceTime. They began to read books that they've been wanting to read, but their life was too busy. They started to garden because they never had time to do that, you know, doing those things. So my point is it absolutely did that, but it didn't have to. If people could regulate their brains and their lives, they could use that time COVID lockdown obviously feels terrible when you're locked down, but the lifestyle that came along with COVID is actually a healthier one for us. Like the takeaway should have been, we all need to slow down. And I know my life has ramped back up to spinning with the world you know, coming out of lockdown, but the balance is you know, not going to that place where we just get in a pleasure seeking loop. That's what all that stuff is like constantly going on the screen to offset the pain that we're allowing ourselves to have in our lives. And I could feel that creeping in for me a little. That's why I'm like, I got to start doing all these healthy mood regulation things so that I don't end up a year from now. I've done nothing and I feel awful. What are some of the things that young men can do to be their absolute best Mm-hmm. So first of all, stop watching porn. <laughs> Number one, like for real. And if you can't stop, invest in stopping. Don't tell yourself you can't do it. Literally, if, if you don't hear anything past number one, the number one thing is if you stop watching porn, it will change everything about the trajectory of your life without you doing anything else. And, and I'll tell you more things in a second, but I'm going to give you an example of a, of a guy I talked to yesterday. And he's one of hundreds where he's 40. He's like, I've wasted the last 20 years of my life watching porn because I've watched porn. I've never finished college. I never got into the job that I wanted. Now I have no idea what I want to do. I'm trained. I'm half trained in this. And so when he said, I'm half trained in this thing, I'm like, do you like that thing? He's like, I don't know. Like he has no sense of he's working in a job that he hates and he assumes he's going to be fired soon because he can't do it well. And he just spends tons of time watching porn. So if you keep watching porn, your life's trajectory is going to be like this. It's either going to be not good, bad, or it's going to be less than your full potential. If you stop watching porn, it's going to go like this. Sky's the limit of what you can create for yourself. Then beyond that, oh, go ahead. Uh, what is your definition of porn? Because there are a lot of men who don't just masturbate to porn, porn, but they masturbate to music videos or social media images. So yep. do that count as porn as well? It does. And so I call it sexual media. And actually, I have to make uh, videos when we get off because I'm making some videos. And right here is on my post-it note, which I haven't gotten very far. It says what you don't know about sexual media. So, you know, even porn exists on a continuum. Everything exists on a continuum. So like clearly if, if you're going to an actual porn site with intense genres of, you know, over the top porn, that is the highest super normal stimulus. It is flooding your brain with dopamine, knocking out functioning of the frontal lobe and desensitizing the reward center in your brain. Then of course there's lower level genres. Then, you know, you come out of porn sites and you go to videos that are just super sexualized. Then you go to still images. Then you go to lower level videos. You go to music, you know, it's a continuum, but especially if you've watched porn, actual porn, all those other things are going to give your brain lots of dopamine. So sexual media is dangerous in and of itself. So when I'm working with people, they'll stop watching porn sites and they'll fall into the trap of thinking it's okay to go on social media or watch videos lower level videos but it's still giving them 
that artificial too much dopamine hit from the screen. You're still a slave to the screen. So no screen, not just no porn, but no screen. Well, I think that's not realistic in life, you know, because it's just not realistic, but no sexual media. So what I tell people is clean up all your feeds and okay, stay what, off it. What I meant was no screen during masturbation, not just no porn, but no Absolutely. screen during okay. Absolutely. Okay, I believe uh, I had uh, interrupted you. What are the other things that men have to do to improve themselves? Yeah, so it's it's what all people should be doing is to figure out what you actually like to do. Like, don't go to school for something somebody told you to go for. Figure out what do I want to do? And especially if you know, have the courage to do that thing. You know, like I work with one one gentleman who's a lawyer and he hates being a lawyer. I'm like, why are you a lawyer? He's like, you know, my family wanted me to be a lawyer. I'm like, what else do you like to do? He's like, I like to paint. And he's like, but I can't make a living out of painting. I'm like, why not? There's lots of people making a living out of painting. But like, so having the courage to actually do the thing that's in your heart, you know, like recognizing that if there's something that you love that's in there, that's an innate quality to you. That's a gift to you and to the world. So like when we don't follow our gifts, it throws us all off. That's what throws people into the screen because they feel bad about living a life that doesn't feel full to them. So when they, when you have the courage to go, I want to go to school to be a farmer, even though my family thinks I'm nuts and I shouldn't be a farmer. If you want to be a farmer, go be a farmer. If you want to be a plumber, be a plumber. If it's going to bring you joy and you're going to spend eight hours doing it each day, and you're going to be putting your brain in this joy mode instead of this stress mode, do those things. But then secondly, balance your life between work and play and rest and do those things in a healthy way. And balancing one's schedule is probably one of the most important things because some people, some will just say men, because we're talking about men, some, some men will just sit on the couch all day and watch videos and porn. Then there's other men who are working 14 hour days. It's very difficult for people to hit the sweet spot of working seven hours a day doing the hobbies that they love, spending quality family time, doing healthy things like exercising and cooking healthy meals and eating them. Like, you know, people, that's why I said the COVID lifestyle, creating more of that is actually a lot healthier. That isn't, that's like, a, you know, being on purpose and balancing your life to be able to create that and spread it out. Those are just the number two things people can do. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And this was a very valuable conversation Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Lay, for being yeah. on The Labyrinth. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. I'm glad to join you anytime. Uh, okay, well, have a great day and I'll talk to you. Yeah, you too. Okay, bye. Bye.